I, I basically uh, started off working as a general practitioner. Thank you. And uh, when I was doing that, I was really struck by how much mental health really underpinned a, a lot of the problems I was seeing. And I went off to, I was particularly working in remote parts of Australia with, with indigenous communities. And uh, was really fascinated by how mental health really, as I said, was an important part. I went off and did my psychiatry training and was, was then particularly interested in how could we prevent a proportion of the people ever developing particular mental health problems and associated physical health problems. And uh, for the last few years I've been uh, involved not only working as the psychiatrist, as Diane was saying, but also writing a government uh, policy, particularly around mental health and what we can do to actually prevent mental health problems. Um, and so my, my presentation today will cover quite a broad range of areas, but I just really wanted to go through, I guess, the first of all, the level of impact of both mental disorder and mental well-being. When we talk about mental health, often people are referring to mental ill health. So I really wanted to sort of go through both mental well-being and mental disorder. And mental disorder, I'm including both mental illness, uh, drug and alcohol problems, um, and also tobacco. Um, and then looking at the promotion of mental well-being, prevention of mental illness, and the background to recent UK mental health policy, I wanted to cover something around risk and protective factors. Protective factors when we're thinking about resilience, obviously spirituality comes, comes in there as a form of resilience. And then uh, we go through various kind of aspects of meditation, uh, looking at how well-being links with meditation, and then really going through various different types of meditation and their impacts in various areas. Um, and then come to Christian meditation, particularly work I was involved in in, in Australia, evaluating the impacts of meditation on a very exciting program where they've got 12,000 um, children, students between the ages of 6 and 18, doing Christian meditation uh, most, of, most of the time on a daily basis. So in terms of the level of mental disorder in the population, um, this for me, as a practitioner, I've really missed out on, and I think it's really helpful to get that context, the population context. One in two people experience mental Ill illness during their lifetime, um, and 38% of the population, that's the European Union population, um, last year experienced at least one mental disorder. So actually, you know, if we're talking about families, it affects every family, um, and, it's, and it's common. And then if we're looking at England, the levels of mental disorder in England, you can see that it's one in 10 children have a diagnosable mental disorder. It's, it's about one in six of the adult population have at least one common mental disorder. That's depression or anxiety. We've got about 1% psychosis. We've got 6% uh, dependent on alcohol, 3% dependent on drugs. One in five are smokers. And then we've got sort of uh, other, we've got personality disorder and then dementia, which affects one in 20 of those uh, over 65 and one in five of those over 80. So that's just the context of mental disorder. And you can immediately see this, is, this is, has, a, has a big burden. But on top of that, we have quite a big group of people who don't reach the threshold for actually receiving a, 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 a diagnosis, but nevertheless are, are, have some symptoms of a, of a particular uh, mental illness or disorder. Um, and you can see there, for instance, it's almost one in five of um, children and adolescents with a sub-threshold conduct disorder. Uh, we've, got, um, we've also got another one in six of the population who have some symptoms of anxiety and depression that don't reach that full threshold. And the reason why this group's important is because a few symptoms of depression uh, that don't actually reach the full threshold can have considerable disability, but also increase your risk of then going on to develop a full threshold disorder. And the impact of mental disorder, what is it? This is, a, this is a, from the, the World Health Organization Global Burden of Disease Survey. What they've done, it's a fantastic resource. You can look it up on Google. And it works out the burden, the burden of disease from qualities, which, which are which are sort of quality, quality adjusted life years. And you can see here that mental disorder actually is the largest single cause of burden of disease, uh, higher than either cancer or cardiovascular disease. And why is that? Uh, well, it's, a, it's, a, it's really due to a combination 
of these four reasons. The fact that obviously we've got very high prevalence rates of disorder, but also that disorder begins early, it lasts for a long time very often, and it has wide-ranging impacts. And so just going to the early manifestation, the, the Kessler references here, so first of all, it's half of lifetime mental illness begins by the age of four, 14, and three quarters by the mid-20s. And that's really shocking. When I was working as a GP, I hadn't appreciated that. And those are, those are actually US figures, uh, and we've incorporated those into the mental health strategy to highlight that if we're thinking about both early treatment, but also prevention, children and adolescents is really a key opportunity to be both promoting <coughs> resilience, good well-being, but also if there are problems, intervening early so that those problems don't extend into adulthood. And those mental health problems are often the precursors to various other problems, so not doing well at school, getting into alcohol and drugs, um, and often we know that once problems have sort of started and got ingrained, they're much more difficult to change later. And those problems lead to a, a range of poor health, both social, physical, spiritual, uh, and uh, a range of other problems. So in terms of if children and adolescents are developing um, mental health problems, what are the impacts, but first of all within childhood and adolescence? I've put here a range of impacts that children and adolescents developing mental health problems experience during their childhood and adolescence. And you can see they're very broad. So they don't do so well at school, their, their health and social skills aren't so good, they have much more higher rates of smoking, alcohol and drug use, uh, and a range of other things that you can see there. And I've pulled the slides, this slide is from the National Psychiatric Mobility Survey for Children and Adolescents. And what, what, what happens in, in England, every seven years, we do a large survey, random survey of 10,000 children and adolescents, and then work out what the level of mental disorder is. So obviously that includes alcohol, drugs. And you can see what's so striking, for instance, with regular smoking, that if you've got conduct disorder, you're six times more likely to smoke than if you don't. And for instance, if you've got if you if you've got conduct disorder, four times more likely to be drinking, um, twelve times more likely to be using uh, hard drugs. But also, you can see there that it impacts on um, self harm, friends, and school exclusion. So that just highlights that actually these impacts are very broad. And conduct disorder is six percent of the children and adolescent population in the UK. Um, if you develop those problems during childhood and adolescence, then that leads to a whole range of other problems. Once you reach 18, it doesn't suddenly stop. So you see that this range of <coughs> other problems um, then appear as a result of those problems you, you started experiencing du during your childhood and adolescence. If you develop a mental disorder during adulthood, you can see, again, a very wide and broad range of, um, of impacts, and you can see that these, these areas aren't just within health, they're, they're outside health, and really across all, do, all domains. And what's the econo economic impact? And economics is important, and it's an important form of advocacy, because uh, it's what cuts across, people understand it very easily, across all political domains. And, and I've highlighted the broad range of uh, effects of mental ill health. Um, and if we're looking at employment, for instance, 44% of people claiming unemployment benefit um, or incapacity benefit are, the, are related to mental ill health. But in terms of number crunching and bringing it down to the, to the, to the nitty gritty of pounds and dollars, um, 105 billion is the annual cost of mental illness in England each year. Well, that's the annual cost. If you convert that to dollars, that's a I was looking at the exchange rates uh, at the, at the airport when I came in yesterday. Not the day before yesterday. That, that works out at about 150 billion US. That's for a population of 15 million. And the US population, I was just speaking with Gene this morning, is about 300 million, which is six times that. So that works out at about 940 billion dollars every year is the cost of mental illness. If we translate those costs to, to the US. Um, to the NHS, the National Health Service, it's about 11% of the annual budget. Um, crime, um, we're looking at um, 
90 billion is the annual cost of crime in England and Wales by adults who as children and adolescents had conduct disorder, which is the most common um, uh, mental disorder during childhood and adolescence. So you can see that this is actually a really <coughs> important economic issue. And I think that's a helpful, helpful to bear in mind. I'll come back to that a bit later. Mental illness also influences um, inequalities in physical health. And of course, you know, as a GP, I've seen people with mental illness, and, and there's a, as, as, the, as the, the last speaker was, was highlighting, there's this big, co there's a big comorbidity between different illnesses. But um, if you've got depression, for instance, you've got a twofold increased risk of heart disease. If you've got uh, depression, you've got higher mortality from all disease. The US figures for psychosis means that, um, that if you've got psychosis, you're 25, you, you, you die 25 years earlier than if you don't have psychosis. Um, and uh, and you, you're much more likely to, uh, you, you've got increased mortality from all disease. I wanted to highlight smoking. Most people don't think of smoking as a mental disorder. But, it, but amongst the um, D DSM, which is the Diagnostic um, manual, manual sort of Classification in the US, certainly it is termed as a mental and behavioral disorder. Um, and we know that those with mental disorder have much higher rates of smoking. 42% of all tobacco consumption in England is by, those with, by, is by someone with a mental disorder. And very similar figures in the US, 43%. Um, and we know that actually that increased smoking is responsible for most of the health inequalities, although people with mental disorder are much less likely to get offered any help. Despite the huge numbers of people with mental disorder, what's so, so shocking really is that only a minority receive any intervention at all. So in the European figures, 10% of, of people with a mental disorder receive a notionally adequate treatment. Um, and if we compare that, for instance, with cancer, certainly when I was speaking with the cancer czar in, in the UK a few weeks ago, he acknowledged that actually most people with cancer will receive some intervention, and rightly so. But there's a bit of a mismatch. Here I've just highlighted the figures in red, the proportion of people with each of those disorders receiving any intervention. It's not necessarily an evidence-based intervention, but again you can see that all of those figures highlight that actually, apart from people with psychosis, it's only a minority of people who will receive any help at all. But these very disabling conditions which then to a, lead to a whole range of other, other problems. That's mental disorder. I'm coming now to mental health, otherwise known as mental well-being. But sometimes people get confused. They're talking about mental health, and actually they mean mental ill health. Um, it's not the opposite of mental, mental illness. The, the, it's very interesting when you're looking at the, these two inter the, the kind of they're, they're, they're domains that kind of cross over one another so that the absence of mental illness doesn't mean that you've got mental wellness and you're flourishing. And similarly, if you've got mental illness, that you can be experiencing well-being. So the, there are these kind of complementary um, com uh, dimensions. And what about the proportion of people experiencing this mental well-being or flourishing, this kind of skip in our step? Corey Keyes from the US has obviously done a huge amount of work on this area. 17% um, in the USA experience this optimal well-being. That's Corey Keyes' figure. It's about 20% in Northwest England, 14% in Scotland. And you can see UK is doing very well on child and adolescent mental well-being. But it's an important, it's an asset space. We're looking at sort of these various kind of things that really kind of are important um, in our lives to make us feel well. And the impact of mental well-being is very, very powerful. Um, in terms of health benefits of mental well-being, we've highlighted this in national policy. Um, they're, they're, they're associated with reductions in mental disorder, physical illness, health care utilisation, and mortality. That's independent of, of mental illness. And then benefits outside health in terms of mental wellness. You can see, uh, and it makes sense, that if you're well, you study better, you work better, you're much less likely to uh, sort of uh, get into trouble, you've got better relationships. So you can see that it permeates really across every aspect of life. So the importance of promotion of mental well-being, prevention of mental illness was, was I guess, uh, in the context of in, in the context of that, um, 
uh, when we're looking at such a large burden and <coughs> levels of treatment, uh, what was really striking for me was that um, coming across surveys, particularly from Australian population data, find that even if everyone with a mental disorder got the best available tre treatment, we'd still only redu be reducing the burden of that disorder by less than 30%. And it just highlights that, again, we, we need to be thinking about prevention and promotion, prevention of mental disorder, promotion of that well-being across the population, uh, as well as targeting people with mental illness, if we're going to sustainably reduce burden over the long term. And so, really, the promotion and prevention agenda uh, is, 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 a key, is a key area that's been recognised, particularly in UK policy development. And since most mental illness starts in, uh, in childhood and adolescence, then clearly it's particularly pertinent uh, during, uh, during the early years and before adulthood, although it's clearly important for all of us. We all need, uh, this, is, this is important for uh, the whole population. I did a, just a bit of background to the recent uh, mental health policy development in the UK. We had, a, we had a new mental health strategy come out in February at No Health Without Mental Health. And, uh, and really sort of this, this highlights a twin track approach that I just outlined the importance of earlier, that as well as treating people early, we also need to be thinking about how we promote the well-being of the whole population to increase that resilience, to prevent a lot of these problems arising in the first place. And it was a cross-government strategy, so it wasn't just health, it was, it was recognising that actually mental health and mental ill health is important to all government departments. It included well-being, and, and this is something which is quite challenging for medics. And I noticed that, you know, see when, when the previous speaker asked uh, where people were from, um, during our training as health professionals, we, we study illness. Uh, and during my general practice training and then psychiatry training, I had no, there was no information on wellness. It's a relatively new kid on the block, but clearly from the, the, the information I've highlighted is very important. But it's got various definitions that does make translation into policy uh, more difficult. We had a public health white paper that came out at the end of last year. And again, um, I was involved in kind of putting the mental health element in there and highlighting that mental health really was very important in terms of these public health policies, health risk behaviour, um, and, and really there's a very exciting way forward where there's an integration of both mental health together with that public health uh, uh, dialogue. This is, what, this is what a section from the public health white paper, and just to highlight that at the top there, they're saying that to, as well as interventions across healthcare services and local government, uh, in terms of better diagnosis and treatment, it's also to improve population mental health that will really sort of do those particular things, but highlighting that there are certain groups we need to target who are at much higher risk of developing these problems. So how can we prevent mental disorder and promote mental health? Does, is it just defined as soon as we're born that we're going to develop or not develop? Clearly public health is about how we look at the population can, and can promote well-being, reduce uh, risk factors and uh, promote uh, protective factors. And uh, this is what I guess a public health approach is, is really looking at. It's looking at the determinants and seeing how we can think upstream and uh, prevent uh, a large proportion of problems arising later. Just put this diagram up here, it's obviously rather rather wordy one, but on the, on the right hand side, on the, on the left hand side, um, it, it just highlights the importance of reducing risk factors. On the right hand side, the importance of promoting protective factors. And then we've got the green in terms of uh, various kind of uh, environmental aspects, both within policy, but also going down to local areas. And all of those coming together to promote well-being and uh, with, with the impacts uh, that that can that can deliver. In terms of protective factors, I've put a, a whole range, a list of, of protective factors for mental health. Um, towards the bottom there, it's not, any, it's, not, it's not an in order of importance, but we have got spirituality. We know that spirituality is important in terms of protecting our, protecting our mental health, but together with a whole range of other things that, that are really important. So we're trying to look across all these things and 
not everyone has to do everything, but it's important if we're taking the context and, and really sort of looking at some of these determinants that we take, pay close attention to those protective factors. We can also think about protective factors um, together with resilience. And I've put these five domains, again, another way of looking at things. Uh, we've got emotional and cognitive capital resilience. We've got social capital. So we know that, for instance, isolation um, is actually a bigger risk factor for premature death than smoking. Um, and so, again, social capital, how do we promote that? We'll be protective of health. And uh, physical health, similarly, is really important in terms of if, if we're if we don't have good physical, if we're physically unwell, it's likely that that's going to impact on our mental ill health. Similarly, environmental capital, we know that where we live uh, is really important in how we feel. And spirituality, I guess, you know, is, 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 is key, and I'll come on to that. In terms of risk factors, then, for mental disorder, uh, we know that actually, if we're looking at, if we're looking at the average number of risk factors that will correlate with the prevalence rates of disorders. So there's a kind of science and one of the one of the guys, Rose, was very important uh, a few years ago now, but in looking at um, for instance blood pressure, if we're able to reduce blood pressure by a few millimetres of mercury, then we can dramatically reduce the numbers of people getting heart attacks and strokes. So similarly if we're able to reduce the number of symptoms or risk factors for say mental illness, or increase the number of protective factors uh, across populations, then we can then we can also do a similar thing. Um, certain groups are at much higher risk, um, and so that, that, those groups are going to proportionately benefit from any intervention much more. And really, if we're looking at a population approach, we're trying to look at the whole population to promote. Uh, well-being across, but also target particular groups at, at much higher risk. In terms of risk, inequality, I was speaking with Jean sort of when, when arriving and coming back from the airport a couple of nights ago. Inequality is such an important driver um, and really sort of underpins so many of the other risk factors for mental Ill, Ill health and associated physical ill health. We've got a cost of inequality that's been totted up as around, uh, well, I guess 18 80 billion US, which multiplied by six, uh, 480 billion, um, 480 billion for, for the US is the cost of inequality if you translate from England. Um, and what I did here for, for, for policy development was to look at the differences in, in the rates of various men, mental health problems in, those, in, household, in people from lowest 20% household income to top 20% household income. And you can just see uh, that it's several times or two or three times for most disorders. But if we go down to drug dependence, you're 33 times more li likely um, as a woman to be drug dependent if you're from bottom 20% household income compared to top. So that's looking at large population sizes. So you can see there's this, there's this increased risk as our household income reduces of us developing these problems. So again, if we're thinking about how we reduce, then, then we need to be thinking about um, accessing particularly uh, those, those groups at much higher risk. In terms of risk factors for mental disorder, if you're a child from bottom 20% household income, you're three times more likely to develop a mental disorder compared to top. Um, and similarly, in terms of parental risk factors for mental disorder, you can see here that maternal stress during pregnancy is really important to address, as, in, as is maternal smoking, low birth weight, if, you're, if you've got a mental health problem as a parent, your child is four to five times more likely to have a mental health problem. Um, and so again, if we're thinking about these things, we can be thinking strategically, hey, we don't need, not, not everyone needs to be doing everything, but certain groups can be actually preventing a large proportion of things by relatively low cost interventions, potentially. Child factors, are, there are a few there, it increases as you get older, boys more than girls. Child abuse, again, really important. So um, child abuse and sexual abuse, I just highlight if you've, got, if you've been sexually abused, you're 15 times more likely to develop psychosis, for instance. And so you can see that those adverse experiences during childhood are really key to, uh, key to actually the development of a lot of mental health problems and reductions in well-being. And preventing those happening from in the first place is really important, as well as offering early interventions. And these kinds of these kinds of things 
addressing risk factors could uh, potentially be a very powerful uh, sort of way of reducing uh, prevalence rates. And risk factors in adulthood, you can see here, again, various things that, that, are, that are important in increasing your risks of developing problems. High risk groups, children with learning disability, six times more likely to develop mental illness, looked after children five times, men in custody 18 times. So again, it's just highlighting that particular groups, for instance, would benefit from uh, health promotion interventions. And then black and minority groups, we know that they're in England, again, very high risk. And prisoners, 20-fold increased risk of psychosis, 130-fold increased risk of antisocial personality disorder. So you can see that if we're thinking around where, where, uh, where is their particular need, these, these figures are helpful. In terms of public mental health interventions, they, there's, a, there's been a lot of fantastic work done in the States, and I've really drawn on that in terms of health policy in the UK. And really, the, the work is astounding, the quality of the work in terms of looking at things that can, be, uh, that can really sort of prevent a lot of these problems. And we, we've kind of summarized them in various kind of cross-government strategies, Royal College of Psychiatry's position statements, uh, as, well as, um, as well as kind of ongoing work and work coming out at the moment. Um, promotion and prevention, as I said, can reduce the burden of mental disorder and also bring about a social as well as economic development and future costs uh, of these, these huge costs, 950 billion US, could be reduced really through this, this approach to a whole population, uh, whole population promotion as well as, as, well as those other areas. Um, and they need to be both universal but also targeted to those high risk groups. And as I said, the, the, the evidence is there, but we need to implement, implement these interventions appropriately if we're going to get the impact. These are the range of interventions, so really across the life course, um, particularly early years, parents, uh, school-based um, programs, um, and then working well, particularly important, so promotion of good mental health at work, early intervention, if problems arise, stress reduction, very important. And then these various other areas that I won't go into. In terms of the economics, we did a lot of work on this with the London School of Economics. Um, and uh, certainly what was, what was really interesting was the returns for each dollar or pound you invest in these, these interventions. Social emotional learning, the top one there, 84 pounds or dollars you, in, you get back for each pound or dollar you invest. Um, so that was the, that was the, that was, it's actually a US program, 270,000 children and adolescents have been through it. It's about recognising emotions uh, and responding to them appropriately, so school-based. Um, similarly, you can see school-based interventions, parenting interventions. The early diagnosis and treatment of depression at work, you get five pounds or dollars back for each pound you spend within the first two years. That's net savings. And work-based mental health promotion, you get £10 back for each dollar you spent, uh, each pound you spent, um, and uh, that's within the first year. So actually, mental health promotion pays. Uh, you can see, as I've highlighted, this is a huge economic issue, but also this gives massive returns to the workplace if you do invest in the health of your staff or your employees uh, in terms of reduced absenteeism, better productivity and better satisfaction from customers or patients. And so coming on to well-being and meditation, of course, um, which is what I wanted to go into next in this next section. Well-being was something that is, is as I said, a bit of a new kid on the block for uh, the medical field, um, but, but there are different types. And the, the, certainly some interesting work was done by the Foresight Mental Capital Project, which was a government-funded project. And some of, the, some of the interesting kind of ideas that came out of work were these different types of well-being, emotional, psychological, social, physical, and spiritual. And obviously within spiritual, we've got meaning and purpose. Um, and then all those different elements, but then we've got different constituents. So Martin Seligman here, again, a huge kind of towering figure in this area, highlighted that there were these four constituents, pleasure, engagement, meaning, and achievement. And uh, certainly we know that pleasure is important, an important part of well-being, but there are limitations to it, as I've highlighted there. 
that it's uh, transitory, obviously doesn't always lead to fulfillment, and potentially acquired through unsustainable means. So these other areas, engagement, meaning, and achievement, are, are also important. Engage, engagement and meaning, uh, otherwise known as eudaimonic well-being, um, is something that is, sort of rings very true to Aristotle's good life. And certainly, um, <coughs> Uh, it, it's kind of it's very important in terms of that overall wellness that we experience. It's interesting that pleasure, engagement, and meaning are all important. Although maximal well, mental well-being occurs with pursuits involving all three, although meaning and engagement have the largest impact. And if we're thinking about meditation that, that Father Lawrence was talking about earlier, meaning that meaning and engagement um, is sort of certainly engagement is very much a, a key part of the process of paying attention. We're engaged with the moment, with, uh, with the experience of maybe some of the distractions coming out. And then the return back to the mantra or whatever technique we're using. So I think it's an interesting way, and I'll come, come on to that a little bit, a little bit later. And so engagement, we've got uh, Csikszentmihalyi, the, the, there's a very famous uh, uh, psychologist uh, here in the US, who's done a lot of work on the science of engagement this process of absorption and being really, really important in terms of overall well-being. And again, that very much fits with, with uh, meditation. As well as that, though, um, what was interesting, of, certainly in terms of Christian meditation, is that certainly it's not a thing that often occurs in isolation. So groups uh, doing kind of meditation within groups very much also facilitates engagement with others and connection with others. That again, if we're thinking about um, wellness, again, you can see how that's feeding into, uh, may, may, be partly explained, may, may partly explain some of the benefits of meditation. And of course, meaning. Uh, we know that doing this practice or uh, doing some kind of practices uh, can give rise to, to meaning, which is an important element of, element of well-being. I just wanted to go through quickly meditation and mindfulness practices and, and, and really some, some of the evidence and start off with the background. Um, it's not a new thing. Uh, the first references are, uh, are sort of um, go back quite a way. And it's not specific, obviously, to any, any one, one tradition. Um, and it's a, I guess that's a particular um, definition there in terms of paying attention. Uh, but it's certainly that there are differences. Uh, but, but certainly, um, really, sort of, there's an emphasis, certainly, there's an acknowledgement that the quality of our consciousness is really uh, important, uh, both for maintaining as well as promoting uh, well being. And certainly, Lawrence was uh, just kind of <coughs> covering that in his talk. In terms of the effects of meditation, this is a review, again, sort of various, various help um, uh, on, on areas uh, that, uh, that meditation is associated with. We've got some obviously very good recent reviews in terms of the neurobiology, so the impacts of meditation. Uh, one particular route by Rubia uh, was, was highlighting that um, meditation was associated with reduced stress-related autonomic and endo endocrine measures. Um, and, but also that you get um, upregulation of areas that are controlling uh, affect, so mood. So you get uh, sort of expansion and increased activity in those areas. Um, and also areas in, of the brain associated with attention. Um, there's, there's, I did for the for the for the UK government a review, I guess, on the impacts of of the various different meditations, and uh, I'm going to really present in these various areas um, just uh, over the next few slides in terms of the evidence. And what struck me when I was doing this was that actually a lot of the evidence is review level evidence, so it's pulled together large numbers of studies. And, uh, and sort of summarize them in a very helpful way. So if we're looking at, say, meditation practices related to health, this review by Ospina sort of looked at 17 um, uh, sort of electronic databases. And they came up with 813 predominantly poor quality studies. So again, the quality of the study is important. But uh, nevertheless, you can see that there's been a fair bit done. The most, these are the most uh, sort of studied conditions. Um, and um, uh, there, were, there, were, there, were some, there were some quite a few studies looking at the therapeutic effects of meditation. Um, Meta-analyses, so, so really bringing a large number of studies together. 
showed that these particular meditations significantly reduced blood pressure. And then there were other, uh, th 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 there was a meta-analysis of results from up 55 studies, again highlighting the impacts in healthy participants. Highlighting the stress reduction from yoga and that both yoga and mindfulness-based stress reduction, which I'll come on to in a minute, were both effective at reducing anxiety in patients uh, with cardio cardiovascular disease. In terms of med meditation as a treatment for, uh, medical, for medical illness, again, we've got a very sort of large kind of uh, array of evidence there that adverse events are, uh, are rarely re uh, are rare um, and that the strongest evidence really was for epilepsy, premenstrual syndrome, and menopausal symptoms. But there were also benefits for mood and anxiety, autoimmune disease, and also um, sort of distress and emotional disturbance um, in cancer. However, again, it's one of these kind of issues that keeps on coming up that there is a lack of large uh, methodologically sound studies, and a lot of these reviews keep on coming up with these with these uh, reminders. In terms of mindfulness interventions, I just wanted to cover uh, these, these areas. Um, uh, mindfulness, as you can see, is kind of a, is a, is a very, very well-developed um, area in terms of research, a lot of research done on it. Um, and it's defined as, defined as the state of being attentive to and aware of what is taking place in the present. So again, if we're thinking about Lawrence's um, description, so there are obviously very distinct similarities there. Um, it's associated with the clarity of current experience of functioning. And basically that awareness has, has a range of benefits. It's helpful that we can disengage from irritating and dis irritating distractions, but also, um, also helpful potentially in terms of unhealthy behaviors. If you've got that greater awareness, that can facilitate behavior change, which is, which is obviously important in terms of improving both mental and physical health. And, and obviously it can contribute to well-being in a direct way by adding clarity and vividness. Um, and uh, really, sort of, I guess, this process of engagement is, is an important element in terms of well-being promotion. So mindfulness interventions, uh, the Department of Health commissioned a review um, and again, these were, the, these were the kind of impacts of mindfulness intervention. So you can see quite broad, uh, obviously we were particularly interested in mental ill health, but also you can see that um, as well as reducing mental ill health, it enhanced, I guess, that well-being, that mental well-being element. So again, quite an exciting broad range of impacts. Mindfulness-based stress reduction um, is obviously something again by a, a US kind of giant, John Kabat-Zinn, and he was very he was very clear from the beginning that studies had to be good quality, high quality, randomised controlled trials. And as I said, it's a kind of, it's a structured psychoeducational skill-based therapy package which combines meditation with yoga exercises. It's non-religious, which means that actually you can get into organisations that religious types of practice find it much more difficult to. Um, and uh, and really, it's, uh, I guess it's, it's really sort of looking at the nitty gritty and facilitating how people uh, really sort of uh, uh, kind of develop that awareness. And the effects, well, again, the, the, the really some sort of very impressive effects. And the research actually has facilitated the inclusion now in NICE guidance. So this is guidance on which, which physicians, uh, practitioners use around treatment. And it's recommended for the prevention of relapse of depression, again, through very impressive uh, evidence-based trials, uh, and also sort of benefits for physical well-being, uh, as well as uh, symptoms, pain, and physical impairment. And the, what's, what's been interesting is long-term follow-up sort of highlights that these, these effects continue. They're not, they're not just short-term. Mindfulness-based stress reduction for stress management. So that's, that's in people who haven't developed mental health problems but are stressed. And obviously, all of us experience stress, uh, depending on, 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 on various things. And, uh, and I guess what's, what's, what's been interesting there is that, uh, again, it was, it was very helpful to reduce ruminative thinking, trait, anxiety, but also to increase that empathy and compassion. Um, and uh, I guess, again, 
this is a review, it's not just one trial, it's a, it's a review of many trials. Um, and also, not only does it reduce stress, but also impacts on anxiety and mood symptoms. So, so again, you can see that the, the, the evidence base has facilitated, I guess, inclusion and now prescription by, by practitioners. We're actually um, we, we were successful in, in getting a grant for our, I, I come from an organisation, King's Health Partners, the Maudsley is one, one arm of that, but it's four medical organisations in central London, 25,000 staff we have. And we're just now um, introducing a mental health promotion intervention or a set of interventions for a proportion of those staff. One of the interventions is mindfulness. And we're looking at the economic impacts of, um, of, uh, of, these, of these different interventions. And as I said, it, it's kind of a, it's a, if we're thinking about 10 pounds the organization saves within one year for each pound spent on activities to promote mental health, this isn't just uh, a sort of an important issue for staff, it's an important issue for the organization in terms of savings from unnecessary costs, if that's looking at things that are rather kind of singular economic angle. Um, and as I said, it's, uh, it's um, in mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, which is kind of, it's an awareness of particular thoughts, that's the focus, is, is, is now uh, recommended for, for those with uh, depression, or we've had three or more episodes of depression in terms of prevention of relapse. Looking at a few other areas, um, mindfulness intubation for substance use disorders, and again, there's conclusive data that, that it's useful, so it's conclusive data that, that, that there's a treatment that, that, uh, that, that there, isn't, uh, there isn't that at the moment, and particularly the, the studies are small. Um, supportive therapy is in cancer care, systematic review, including three randomized controlled trials, and again, showing that uh, that, that actually uh, that it is beneficial for, for those people experiencing cancer. Sleep disturbance, um, again another review sort of highlighting that mindfulness is, uh, helps improve sleep. Uh, we, we know that if we sleep well, it's likely that our well-being will be enhanced. If we're not sleeping so well, it has an impact. And obviously, poor sleep is also uh, a, a side effect of, or, or it is a symptom of mental ill health. Vipassana meditation, again, another type of meditation which really focuses on, on insight. Um, and, you can, and you can see that, uh, uh, again, the studies haven't been great, uh, but uh, there is a suggestion that it is particularly helpful in, in prison populations. Zen meditation, uh, again, uh, we can see that uh, there is some evidence, but again, not strong. And of course, we come to Christian meditation. Um, unfortunately, there, there isn't a great deal of evidence, uh, certainly in adults. But I just wanted to highlight that last year, the Christian Meditation <coughs> Centre put an online questionnaire um, on the web. And uh, these, are the, these are the responses. We got, we got almost 600 responses, more women than men. And you can see North America <laughs> was only second uh, to, to the UK and Ireland. Um, and uh, you can see it's mainly older, older people who replied to this questionnaire. What was interesting was that we asked about whether people have had mental health problems or not. And it was about half admitted that they had had mental health problems, while another half uh, hadn't. But I was really interested in this kind of finding that, again, if we're thinking about a pr the effects of meditation on promotion of well-being, we can see that significant positive impact on well-being and mental health was occurred in very similar proportions, so almost three quarters of those without mental health problems <coughs> and 80% of those with mental health problems. And again, you can see that uh, the next thing, the proportion of people feeling much more relaxed, was very similar uh, in people who both had mental health problems or, or didn't, and similarly, the proportion of people feeling much less stress was 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 actually uh, was very similar and, and significant. If we're looking at an impact, um, it was, I thought these were very impressive kind of uh, responses. And then the proportion of people feeling much less anxious, proportion experiencing better mood, and proportion coping with everyday dif difficulties of life much more easily. So you can see that actually it didn't matter whether you had a mental health problem or not. The impact of meditation was very significant. Mm -hmm. Proportion feeling much more hopeful and proportion sleeping much better. Again, lower 
but, uh, but, but again, interesting, we're thinking about a large population doing Christian meditation uh, and translating these findings. And then if we go to meditation in children and adoles adolescents, um, again, large reviews done um, highlighting that, that actually uh, mindfulness meditation, TM, MBSR, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, um, can, uh, can have impacts on a, on a, on a broad range of, uh, uh, of, of, of youth. But these, are, these, are generally, these studies have generally been uh, restricted to those, those, those children and adolescents with, uh, with conditions. But it does, does appear to be effective um, uh, for, for children. Um, we had a review by an Australian, Christine Burke, and again, uh, general support, although high quality studies are lacking. ADHD, there was a review, um, and again, there was lack of, uh, lack of high quality studies. And then really the last thing I wanted to cover was Christian meditation in Australian schools that I mentioned at the beginning. And I was working over in Australia as a psychiatrist, and, um, and I discovered that they just uh, introduced meditation into, well now it's 33 schools, 12,000 students between the ages of 5 and 18. And I was, I was interested, I guess, in the, in the impacts of meditation. And, and as it happened, no one was evaluating the impacts. And so we used a, we used a sort of semi-structured questionnaire to, to go and interview students in, in three schools. It was a very small study. Um, and really, sort of what, what we found was that there was certainly a, 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 an enthusiasm from the majority of students. Um, but a minority of teachers did, in, did sort of did uh, report some negativity. The majority of teachers reported positive effects on, of meditation on the class and were positive about the program. What I did, I went through, we, we, inter we recorded all the, all the interviews with, with the, the students and then transcribed them. And I went through the transcriptions and then looked at what words were kind of brought up frequently. You can see here in terms of calming and relaxation in terms of student responses, um, uh, teachers uh, also reporting calm, calming of students and relaxation, uh, and similarly parents. So, so calming and relaxation seem to be a sort of a, a, a strong theme. In terms of the impacts on concentration, uh, nearly half the students reported improved concentration, while nearly half the teachers also uh, sort of concurred with that. Pro-social behaviour, so interaction with others, again uh, seem to be uh, seem to be quite a common um, uh, uh, sort of feedback, and that some that the meditation benefited particularly those students who were um, having greater difficulty. In terms of the teachers, certainly, what was interesting was teachers sort of described the benefit in their own lives, but. The second bullet there was that sort of 37% uh, of the students really sort of thought that if teachers meditated, they would be, uh, they would, it would basically help them feel much more calm and relaxed. So again, it was an interesting kind of feedback around the impact of the program. What I was really struck by was though that 39% of students have started meditating outside school, particularly at times of stress. So there did seem to be this transfer of the skills that they've learned to, um, to sort of situations outside school that I thought was, was really uh, very impressive. We did, go to, uh, we did go to Palm Island. Palm Island has is is, got a very sort of sorry history, but, it, but a lot of Aboriginal populations uh, were forcibly moved to this island and they've got the highest rates of uh, imprisonment <coughs> and uh, domestic violence anywhere in Australia. And so a high risk population. Uh, and meditation was introduced in the Catholic school there. And it was very interesting speaking to some of the teacher aides that not only had it been kind of, it had been uh, really sort of taken up, but it was consistent with the Aboriginal um, views on and previous traditions on reflection. Um, and, and so it was something consistent with that and potentially a great opportunity to be incorporating and again trying to address some of the issues around or protect against some of the effects of inequality, the risk factors are highlighted earlier. So really there's a huge potential, but again, if we're thinking around half of lifetime mental illness has arisen by the age of 14, if we're thinking about 
such a health promotion intervention, for instance, for children and adolescents, huge opportunity to be promoting resilience and therefore preventing at least a proportion of children and adolescents who would have otherwise gone on to develop these disorders, which then extended to uh, a whole range of health misbehaviour and then much higher rates of adult mental illness in the, in the future. And as I said there, particularly for those at high risk, uh, very low cost and the potential varies with high economic returns as well <coughs> on such interventions. So, in summary, I'm sorry it's been a bit of a, a bit of a marathon set of slides. This, but in terms of in terms of the impacts, we know that they're very significant, both in terms of the impacts of good mental health, but also the impacts of mental disorder. We know that there are high levels of mental disorder, but low levels of well-being across the population. Uh, however, there are, we know there's a very good set of evidence uh, around interventions which can promote mental health um, and uh, prevent, reduce the impact of mental disorder. But that since most mental disorder starts in childhood and adolescence, that's the key time. Although schools, important settings, workplace is another really important setting in terms of we've got a, we've got a group of people together, we can really kind of have a big impact. We know that there's a very good evidence base for meditation, certainly mindfulness. I think there is, a, there is more a way, way to go in terms of uh, promoting the research base for uh, certainly for Christian meditation, but others as well. Um, the impacts of meditation certainly are <coughs> closely integrated with, I guess, the, the, the impacts on spiritual well-being. And again, that's another area that could, I think, be very interesting to follow up. Um, and the associated re resilience has a huge impact across these range of areas. So improve resilience to broad range of adver adversity, uh, reduce uh, health risk behavior, uh, reduce mental and physical illness, reduce antisocial behavior, improved educational and employment outcomes, reduced inequality, and with that, the saving of huge amounts of uh, not just um, money, but untold suffering and uh, distress experienced by both people experiencing mental health problems but also their families and carers. Um, I'll just put my contact there, happy to send anything, the mental health strategy, the, the web link, and then the Royal College of Psychiatrists. Uh, no Health of That Public Mental Health Physician Statement summarises the evidence base really that I've described and uh, happy to forward to anyone.